And during that discussion, this isn't related to vegan diets or anything, but during that discussion, what, uh, what ended up coming up was, you know, a lot of the behavior in the carnivore community is like really indicative of eating disorders because like they do like this weird, like kind of, um, restrict and binge cycle, like the OMAD thing, like one meal a day, mm -hmm. um, you know, they'll go like seven days without eating and then they'll just do one day where they just go fucking buck wild and they'll they'll just like <laughs> eat everything they can, you know, put in front of their face. And then they'll do like another seven days of, of fasting or whatever with just like water or salty water or whatever. And it's like, yeah, this is, I, I don't know how else to characterize this other than just these people ha are, they probably just have like a closeted eating disorder. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I, th I'm pretty sure that it, that some of the behavior that happens in that community, that's actually endemic to that community could reasonably class be classified as an eating disorder under like the DSM. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> what is up everybody? My name is Kyle Matovic. I am the host of the In Liberty and Health podcast where we talk all things liberty, health and wellness and beyond. My hope is to encourage and spread the message of liberty and physical and mental well-being. I hope you enjoy all the topics we talk about with our guests. We're on all major streaming platforms, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy. Man, I'm doing as good as anyone can do getting buried by his 13-year-old son on leg day. <laughs> I'm not going to apologize for not being on this podcast because I got to go see Metallica, so... If that's a problem, kiss my ass. Okay? I am. <laughs> All right, everybody, this is In Liberty and Health, and today I have Mr. Nick Hebert with me. Um, pretty excited because he's been one of the people who's really informed my view on nutrition. And I, I think I remember the way I came across um, Nick was uh, the debate with Alan Flanagan and uh, – Tucker Goodrich over seed oils. And I remember seeing you in the comments section, and this is back when I was carnivore. So I was like, oh man, no, a Alan got owned, you know, screw this. You, the seed oils are awful for you. And now looking back, I listened to that debate again, probably about a month or two ago. And I was like, oh, holy hell, what a charlatan. How much of a dumbass was I to believe that? So sorry for the long winded introduction. How you doing, dude? Not too bad. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have to say, unfortunately, I mean, as much as it pains me to admit it, that Alan did lose that debate. Um, if a debate, if winning a debate is, you know, just m like if debate performance is measured in how well each party supported their case and presented their case and, um, you know, flagged sophistry and what one and whatnot. Yeah, Alan Alan's performance wasn't very good, but mm -hmm. it led to um Tucker getting absolutely eviscerated in a debate with Matthew Nagra, um, probably about a year later, actually. Um, so what happened was I was, you know, challenging Tucker to a debate on Twitter, as one does, and he just refused to engage with me. In fact, he blocked me and then behind the block said that he is re declining and rejecting all future debate invitations from me personally. So just quantifying over all future debate invitations, not going to happen. He even he turned down $10,000 to to back out of a de debate with me. So he's very committed to not engaging with me. So I was like, okay, there's got to be a way to do this kind of vicariously. <laughs> so I, I, you know, solicited my buddy uh matthew nagra to debate tucker on my behalf right i gave him all of my arguments i gave tuck i gave uh matthew all of my arguments all of tucker's arguments we laid them out in in formal formats and we said listen um we're just going to go through all of these different arguments and we're going to go over the rebuttals we're going to go over the defenses for all of your arguments and we're going to go over all of the data we ended up generating about 200 pages worth of material. And yeah, Matthew was like really primed and ready to go. And Tucker was none the wiser. He stepped into the ring with Matt and he got absolutely annihilated, just eviscerated. Um, after the debate was over, I think we counted, there was like nine literal contradictions that Tucker had uttered. And there were... 
a bunch of equivocations, a bunch of red herrings, and a lot of rule violations. That that debate actually had a, a mutually agreed upon set of rules that all of the participants had to um, agree to. And Tucker violated those rules. I think it was like 59 times or some some ridiculous number like that. Yeah, it was a shit show. But yeah, that's uh, the backstory behind behind that whole thing. Um, yeah, fun times. <laughs> yeah, um, I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, that one in particular as well, because that was uh, the proof with Simon Hill. And um, I've really enjoyed listening to him recently. And um it's funny, and I don't know kind of where you come from nutritionally, and actually we can get into that, but I'm kind of like listening to a lot more of the people that I originally would have thought were like out of their minds now. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a much greater like appreciation for like the patients and like how much these people actually know, because, you know, as far as I could, as I was concerned, probably four years ago, um, Nina Teichels, Gary Tobbs, Jason Fung, uh, Sean Baker, Paul Saladino, Ken Berry, um, name like the fasting carnivore, low carb zealot. Um, they were on my playlist at all times. And I couldn't wait to tell everybody about how you should just eat meat, nothing else. And that's, <laughs> you, you're going to live forever that way. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. After kind of falling out of that world, because it turns out, you know, binging every other week isn't very healthy for you. Um, that's when I kind of came around. Um, I want to say Lane Norton was probably like the main guy and kind of putting like the dent in the armor for me. And it was like, I didn't like any of these people. And then just over time, like, oh, no, they're right. And I'm a fucking retard. That's all. <laughs> and, and then, you know, like when I argue with people about this, like, but I saw this video that says the $100 billion food that's making your food toxic. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's people say like, oh, this isn't a clickbait title. I'm like, it's, it's a fucking clickbait title? What are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> Very easily a clickbait title. Yeah, I have a response video to that particular video, actually. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Joseph Everett is another person who really just like kind of habitually makes like he's the guy who has the channel um, uh, what I've learned yeah uh, his name's Joseph Everett and he makes a lot of really ridiculous claims and when you challenge him on any of those claims he doesn't want anything to do with it he doesn't respond he doesn't give any kind of um you know, airtime to any dissenting views from anybody or when he's just been straight up corrected. He doesn't he doesn't give any corrections. He doesn't do anything. He just lets the garbage that he puts out just stand. Um, and I find that to be like really distasteful behavior from him. Um, I recently wrote a blog article. Actually, I, I shouldn't necessarily say that I wrote it because it was a huge community effort. Have you ever heard of Brandolini's Law? No. Brandolini's law is a it's a principle why whereby um it takes 10 times longer to debunk bullshit than it took to state the bullshit to begin with. <laughs> okay. So when Joseph Everett makes a 40 minute video and he just absolutely fills it with sophistry it's just going to take way too long to comb through it for any one individual. So I had like a team of 15 people and they all had like the sections that they were going to work on based on their personal expertise. So we had like a statistician, we had um, a couple doctors, we had, um, Oh God, like, a I think somebody who works in physiology, um, we had somebody who works in a nutrition science lab, and we just had all of these people. We had a few med students, and they were all just going through these claims systematically and seeing if they actually held up to scrutiny. And there was only actually one claim in that entire video that even had like a, a sliver of truth to it, and that was vegans probably, especially vegan women, should like probably monitor their iron status. But their iron status is something that's going to be measured with a normal like kind of physical and blood work anyway so it's not even like a special uh concern in terms of monitoring considerations it's just a special concern in terms of like food selection um so that was like the only claim that he made that it was even like remotely true the rest of them were just like utter fabrications in some cases like where he would make a claim and then he would provide a reference and nothing that supported the claim could be found in that reference at all and oftentimes contradictory information could be found in that reference it's like wait a second 
Well, didn't you read with it where the authors wrote that, that this is actually a more probable explanation? Um, yeah. So that blog article that was written, it's about 15,000, 20,000 words ish. And it's about a 60 minute read from front to back. And I think we address 53 individual claims that he made. And only one of them actually ended up having a sliver of truth. It just, these people drive me nuts. It just takes so much work to demonstrate why they're full of shit. Um, yeah, it's like uh, it's like the bane of my existence. Like I, <laughs> I just hate it. Yeah, no, I completely understand that, and uh, it's kind of like why I get so frustrated interacting with people on Twitter when it comes to nutrition stuff. Because like, and I try to never boil it down to like, well, I'm more jacked than you, so you should listen to me, but like. Hmm. A lot of the time, these people typically aren't in that good of shape, and they're telling me about all this stuff. It's like I have a work, you know, now over 200 podcasts, and I've done probably a dozen or so on nutrition where I should I go through the studies and then talk about them at depth and then link to articles and stuff like that. And people just have like no time for it because it's much easier to go on TikTok and have somebody tell you it takes 30 hours for your body to just sugar. So therefore you shouldn't <laughs> eat carbs or like I've had people <laughs> tell me shit like this or they'll show yeah. me a TikTok or a video like the one we were talking about earlier. And it's like, like you said, to refute that bullshit takes just exponentially more time than it yes. does just state that bullshit. And, and by the time you're like done refuting it, the people don't even care about what you have to say. So it's like... Uh, it's so fucking annoying and like yeah it's a blessing to have social media and the internet where we have such easy access to information but the downside to that is i've kind of been laying out is just that people get spoon-fed bullshit all the time yeah i think um language ai actually has the potential to kind of nuke this entire problem um i mean it's a it's kind of like a double-edged sword uh, language AI that's given access to the scientific literature, given the capacity to interpret it, and given the same epistemic and kind of uh, standards that we use, adheres to the same virtues and science that we adhere to. If we had a language model that did that, it would be very trivial to debunk a lot of the bullshit. It, it, a complete debunk could be rendered in seconds, right? Uh, it wouldn't be that big of a problem. Now, an artificial intelligence could also produce bullshit just as easily as it could as it could produce you know um truths and you know refutations to the bullshit but i think that is probably manageable because the refutations would be just as easy to crank out right now it's a the bottleneck is just like the human th the, the throughput of the human brain but one person could state a proposition that is utterly false and it could take somebody and it could take like 10 seconds, but it might take an expert 10 minutes to explain why that 10 second proposition is false. Um, or depending on how complex it is, it could take them up to an hour to fully explain why that 10 second proposition is false. But for a language AI, it would take seconds for it to produce the answer. Um, so I think in, ter in terms of Brandolini's law, I think shortening the lag time to a rebuttal is way more attainable now that we have like really robust um, language AIs that can actually spit out information that's actually pretty credible, uh, given that they're trained on the right data, given that they're trained on the right information. So I'm really hopeful for AI to en end up actually kind of offering somewhat of a correction in this regard, because the bullshit is pervasive and it's being cranked out faster than any t human or teams of humans could ever hope to um, address it. So, yeah, I don't know. How, I don't know where the path forward. I guess there's a couple path for. There's a couple paths for um, generating rebuttals with AI is a really good way to go about it. Or inoculating the public against bullshit with better education is also another way to go about it. Mm -hmm. um, neither one of those solutions. I'm terribly expert in so i don't really have that much of an opinion but it seems like either one of them or both in conjunction would be um a step in the right direction yeah it's kind of funny that you brought up ai because uh in my world kind of like the libertarian 
political world, um, a lot of people, there's a religious sect of people who literally think that AI is just all bad. And mm. I, I, I'm agnostic. So like the religious stuff I don't care about, but like all the time it's, Oh, AI is demonic. And it's like, Jesus, you guys are fucking killing me. Like this is going to be a tool much like the internet is. And yeah. you can, it's like fire. You could choose to cook food with it, or you could choose to burn your house down with it. Some people are going to go lighten up the neighborhood and some other people are going to choose to heat up food for other people's to consume. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just like this idea that it's monolithically bad. This also applies to nutrition stuff too, but like, I, I, just people get dogmatic about this. You know, this all has to be monolithically bad or monolithically good. It shit just drives me nuts. People who just apply zero nuance to any topic at all. Yeah, I take tools in general to just be like kind of normatively neutral, which means I, I don't really take them to have like properties like good or bad outside of like, you know, like the types of actions that they're used to facilitate. Um, so, yeah, I don't think AI is bad. Um, I think it can be used for for bad things. Um, I can also I also think it can be used for good things. I hope it ends up being used more for good things than bad things. But I I don't think there's any way to stop the technology at this point that's practical anyway. Yeah, no, I I definitely agree. Um, the other thing that kind of drives me nuts with this approach to nutrition, and one thing that um you know you've spent a lot of time debunking is you know as we kind of talked about a little bit earlier is the seed oil stuff where i mm -hmm. see people just demonizing that and then um you know non-nutritive sweeteners just like i was in an argument with somebody once and they said oh high fructose corn syrup is poison this stuff is awful for you i'm like well if you control for calories it's not bad for you but the problem is nobody drinks an 140 calorie coke and says all right well now i can't have that you know bowl of fruit or whatever yeah. later they just drink three Three more and don't think anything of it and then people say oh well it's like this it's like that well when calories aren't controlled it's not satiating there's no nutrients so yeah you're probably gonna get fat and it's probably not <laughs> good for most people to consume that but if you control for calories it's not bad and so i was trying to make a point to this person and i linked a uh, article that lane norton did um the why sugar didn't cause the obesity epidemic and mm -hmm. um you know of course as soon as i like that people just oh no i'm not reading that it's like oh here's a reputation of like everything that you could ever want to know about sugar but people yeah. just will, will take zero time to read it but yeah the, the guy kept telling me oh this is bad this is bad i'm like well i don't like frame food as like a moral problem and he said well i'm not putting morality to it well you're saying this is bad this is poison that that's sounds pretty moralistic to me all right, guys, we are going to take a quick break from the show to tell you about the show's sponsor. We are now brought to you by Fox and Sons Coffee. As you can see right here, I got the Den Blend Dark. Really enjoy that. Um, I've been drinking a lot of their Brazil honey prep right here. As you can hear, there's not a lot of beans left in it because I've been drinking it quite a bit. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Fox and Sons, why I support them and why you should too, is that uh, Stephen had started the company up in Michigan to help teach his son about entrepreneurship. Um, I'm all about that. I do firmly believe that in order to spread liberty in our lifetimes, we have to support those who support similar values as us. And Stephen does support all the same libertarian values that I bring and talk about on the show a lot. So go to foxandsons.com, use code Kyle at checkout to get 15% off of orders, $25 or more. And there's always free shipping whenever you place an order that is more than $37.99. Um, find their coffee absolutely fantastic, and I'm sure you will too. So uh, one more time, go to foxandsons.com, use code Kyle at checkout to get yourself a little discount, let them know I sent you, and support the coffee that supports you. All right, guys, thanks. Back to the show. Yeah, I mean, as far as like um, high fructose corn syrup is concerned, I think yeah, the problem is that and the problem there for the for the average person is that like for most goals, for most reasonable goals that people are going to have, high fructose corn syrup is going to be like very difficult to shoehorn into facilitating those goals. Like it's not in most cases, it's not going to be something that's going to be terribly easy to make compatible with those goals. Right. But that's not to say that it's like inherently bad. I'm still trying to figure out like what's supposed to be bad about high fructose corn syrup, except for the fact that it can be like smuggled in to foods in like liquid form and it's not very satiating. Um I don't think it's like in it like bad independent of that. Um, but if you can shoehorn that into your diet and make it compatible with your goals, I don't see the issue. Um, 
like th this is one of the things that I've kind of noticed is typically if we do find a nutrient of concern like sodium or saturated fat, for example, or, um, you know, any, any other nutrient of concern, we typically see the same effect regardless of whether or not it's inside or outside of a food matrix, you know? So, um, take, you know, saturated fat, for example, if we isolate it and feed it to people, as long as it's not like high in stearic acid or whatever, it tends to raise LDL. And then we feed people steak and, you know, you control for the amount of saturated fat, tends to raise people's LDL. Um, you know, you take sodium, you take this much sodium as a, as a pill or a supplement, it raises your blood pressure. You add this much sodium to a total diet and blood pressure goes up by the same amount. And then we take this whole class of foods called fruit, which is high in sugar, <laughs> And it seems to lower mortality risk and do all of these cool things for the human body. Yeah. And and then we isolate the sugar and then somehow it's bad. Like this is like the only case where this happens, where we isolate the nutrients and all of a sudden it has the reverse effect. I personally don't really buy it. I think sugar is probably fine, except for the fact that when you do isolate it, it doesn't contribute to satiety. Um, so it's difficult to shoehorn into uh, somebody's goals but other than that yeah I, I i wouldn't say that there's probably a huge problem with it yeah i'm kind of like working on this mental model of putting foods more on like a spectrum of like non-satiety inducing but enjoyable versus like nutrient dense and satiating so like you would have perhaps your more lean animal proteins over on the side of like nutrient dense and satiating your fruits your vegetables and I hate to say whole foods because everyone says like a whole foods kind of diet. Well, yeah, yeah. What, what's a whole food look like to you? Because if you ask 20 people, you're going to get 20 different answers. But like, yeah, you yeah. know, once again, leaner meats, um, fruits, vegetables on the side of like satiety inducing and more nutrient dense. And then like, you know, ice cream or, you know, a loaded up burger, or, you know, baked potato with sour cream and butter over on the more like enjoyable, yeah. but less satiating side. So it's not like the terms of good or bad. It's just like, Hey, you may really enjoy this food, but depending on your goals, this may put you further away. Now that doesn't, once again, that's not good or bad. This is just understand that if you eat this giant you know, sweet potato with, you know, three teaspoons of brown sugar and five teaspoons of butter, and it's going to taste delicious, but that's going to yeah. be a fuck ton of calories. Now you're going to be further <laughs> away from your goal, depending, you know? Yeah. Now it's actually funny that you mentioned this. Um, I have a product. Um, it's actually just like a really complicated interactive spreadsheet. Um, it's called the Nutridex and it's available on my website or whatever, but the interesting thing about this is that we, I do have a satiety score. There's 720 foods ish on the list and then you can sort them by their satiety value. And the way we actually came up with the satiety score was I worked with uh, somebody who I think is a mathematician and they have this piece of software that can take a whole bunch of input data and do what's called um, um, a genetic calculation, I believe, or um, I can't remember uh, it's like a genetic algorithm or something that it can basically find the commonalities between all of these foods that lead to them being more satiating or less uh, as long as you're using like some reference data. So we use the uh, um, Holt, or Holt 1995. There is actually one paper on this that stratifies foods by their relative satiety value. And we use that as the kind of blueprint and then we ran the genetic calculation or the genetic algorithm. I can't remember what it's called. I'm probably embarrassing myself. But um, we were able to stratify foods by common characteristics that correlate with higher satiety. Um, and it ended up being a, about what you would expect. Um, I know there was another... Uh, there, there was another kind of organization, quote unquote, that did something like this. Um, NutritionData.org, I believe, they have something called the Fullness Factor, where they also use genetic pro genetic genetic programming. They, all, they also use genetic programming to um, come up with a satiety index of their own using Holtz uh, 1995 data, and our results were pretty much the same. So. Um, yeah, so the Nutridex has like a satiety score. You can sort foods by their relative satiety value. And 
yeah, it seems to be about as robust as you could probably get. Holt's data only covered like 40 foods at most, probably. And uh, there's about 700 foods in there. So there's some that are being extrapolated, like the 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 results are extrapolated. They're not actually a reflective of something that we've tested in the real world experimentally, to my knowledge. But I would say that it's probably about as robust as you can get, um, given the data that's available. I mean, I'm really proud of it. I think it's actually really cool. Um but yeah, if anybody's interested about that, you know, or if anybody has any interest, it's on my website. <laughs> yeah, well, I know you've also done, um, you run your Nutrivore website where you've kind of focused on food and their overall nutritional quality. Um, and that's something that um, I feel like some of the flexible dieting people may not always get is, uh, and I hate to do the straw man, but, you know, people think, okay, well, you, I can have a pop tart and then a scoop of whey protein. And, you know, <laughs> now I got my, my complete meal because, you know, that pop tart's going to have fats and carbs and then your protein powder is going to be your protein. Um, yeah. it, it seems like you've kind of, I don't say gone out of your way, but you've gone out of your way to make sure that you have kind of laid out information for people where, Hey, you know, you may want to target these foods over these foods. Um, well, the Nutridex itself doesn't make any, like, prescriptions necessarily. All it does is say, like, okay, here are your goals, and then it spits out a stratification of foods um, according to their compatibility with those goals. But it doesn't say, like, which ones you should eat, right? So just to, just to paint this um, a little bit more clearly, this product is produced by a vegan, and there are plenty of animal foods on that list, and even though they might come up high um, on the stratification with respect to a number of different goals, I would recommend against eating them. <laughs> so, I mean, the uh, the Nutridex doesn't really make any like prescriptions. It's more like an academic tool. Um, and th there are some there have been some people who've kind of recognized its utility as an academic tool and used it to structure um, kind of. Uh, meal plans and whatnot for a few clinical trials. I can't name any names, but there are some people out there who have actually made clinical trials using the Nutridex, the information in the Nutridex to structure meal plans for participants and study subjects and whatnot. So it's more like an academic tool than it is like something that'll tell you what to do uh, necessarily. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Um, so when did you kind of decide you wanted to start studying nutrition stuff? Because I mean, this is just a hell of a rabbit hole. And like, I think we all probably had that Dunning Kruger effect where like you first mm. get into it and you feel like, you know, everything, this was like carnivore for me because my wife, my wife had to go gluten free because she has celiacs. So yeah. that was kind of like the first you know, droplet in my mind that said, Hey, nutrition might matter. So of course, Jordan Peterson was real big and, you know, the carnivore diet was getting floated around everywhere. You know, everyone yeah. heard Michaela Peterson's story, you know, whether or not that be true or not, none of my business, neither here nor there. <laughs> I remember trying it and I felt good. And then, you know, kind of went through that, got over that and uh, kind of moved on from there. And, you know, throughout that, like two years that I did carnivore, I thought I knew everything. And then, you know, you realize, oh, <laughs> once you get over that, you're like, I, I know like nothing. <laughs> so that's when I just started listening to everything I could, plant-based, carnivore, low-carb, flexible dieting people. But it seems like more and more I come back to more like flexible dieting people or maybe even like Mediterranean plant-based people now. They seem um, like the most reasonable, I would agree. Yeah, right, The flexible right. dieting people seem to have, I mean – there has been very little produced by that crowd that I found like super objectionable, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, the only kind of meme that floats around in that community that I, that I can't wrap my brain around is like, they seem to be very flippant about sodium. Like they don't think sodium is a problem. They seem to be very flippant about, uh, you know, um, saturated fat. They don't think that's a problem or whatever. So, I mean, but otherwise, I would say that community probably um, is one of the more reasonable ones. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and it's actually interesting. Nobody's ever asked me, like, how I got into nutrition to begin with. I, I've been on plenty of podcasts. Nobody's actually asked me that question That's to my surprising. knowledge. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, because they've all been, like, specifically nutrition podcasts. Nobody needs to ask the question. They, like, it's it, it's, it would just be like, Oh, it's because I had an interest in it. You know, that's how I got into it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually a, a really stupid story. So back in like <laughs> 2008, 2009, I was dating a girl who 
later we found out was like bipolar. She had like clinical depression. But at the time, being like a stupid 20 something year old, um, I was thinking, well, you know, you probably should see, you know, a specialist or a professional about your problems. But let's see if there's anything you can do for it that's within your control that doesn't require like seeing a professional. So then I started researching like interaction between diet and mental health and stuff like that and you know found some things and was like hey why don't you try this and you know placebo effect probably explains exactly what you know happened next but maybe there was like you know she felt a little bit better or whatever and i was like oh man diet's all powerful diet's like really interesting and you can do all sorts of wacky things with it and i didn't know that so it like kind of opened up a door for me uh and then by i think 2010 i started going to the University of Manitoba and I was taking human nutritional science. I didn't finish that degree though. I just I started, didn't finish. Um, but yeah, that's kind of how it started. I, before then I have had zero interest in nutrition. Um, the only interaction really that I had with nutrition before that point was when I was 19 years old. I think I was a, around 19 years old. I was approximately 265 pounds. Like I was a big, I was huge. I was a big guy. Um, so I was like, well, what, what do the healthy people eat? Tofu and broccoli. I was like, okay, so I'm going to eat tofu and broccoli and nothing but tofu and broccoli. So I ate nothing but like tofu and broccoli, um, give or take some other things for about two years. And I lost like a hundred pounds, um, like well over a hundred pounds. I think Good the lowest Lord. I've been, yeah, the lowest I've been in that time was approximately 145 pounds. So I lost about 120. So I'm I'm like a buck 70 right now. So yeah, that was the only interaction before the whole girlfriend thing that I had with uh with diet was like, okay, nothing but tofu and broccoli, lose a shit ton of weight <laughs> and then uh then start getting into exercise and then going to school for nutrition, yeah. Holy crap. I couldn't imagine eating nothing but tofu and broccoli. I would that's that's hella <laughs> discipline. Did did you have like binging episodes at all or no? No. No. Holy crap. Yeah, good lord. Yeah. I, I did carnivore for two years and um about every week, every other week, I would, you know, if my wife and I would go out, I'd have to get dessert or something like that. And I'd be, mm -hmm. you know, shoveling down cheesecake, ice cream, whatever. <laughs> And like, you know, of course I'd go back to the carnivore groups and tell them all about, oh, I'm so dedicated. Look at me just eating this. And I would do my longest fast ever was I did 133 hours. And that was after, um, yeah, yeah. My wife and I and her family, we went to Ocean City and I just ate like shit that entire week. And I came back and literally didn't eat from the Sunday that we got back until the Saturday morning, um, that following Saturday. Yeah, it was is bad and like looking back at that now i'm like holy fuck i had disordered eating like a <laughs> motherfucker and, and like it, it it doesn't hit you until you're kind of like outside looking in but i think that's where like a lot of people who end up on these real strict diets kind of get to and that's kind of why i rail against them so much yeah i i mean it's it's really weird i actually have a podcast episode on my website um related to vegan diets and eating disorders sorry i should get a little closer to this um i have a podcast episode on my website related to eating disorders um and their interaction or ostensible interaction with uh vegan diets and whatnot mm -hmm. and during that discussion this isn't related to vegan diets or anything but during that discussion what uh what ended up coming up was you know, a lot of the behavior in the carnivore community is like really indicative of eating disorders because like they do like this weird like kind of um, restrict and binge cycle, like the OMAD thing, like one meal a day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they'll go like seven days without eating and then they'll just do one day where they just go fucking buck wild <laughs> and they'll, they'll just like <laughs> eat everything they can, you know, put in front of their face. And then they'll do like another seven days of of fasting or whatever with just like water or salty water or whatever. And it's like, yeah, this is, I, I don't know how else to characterize this other than just these people ha are, they probably just have like a closeted eating disorder. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty sure that it, that 
some of the behavior that happens in that community that's actually endemic to that community could reasonably class be classified as an eating disorder under like the DSM. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> like, uh, I I put money on it actually. I think. Yeah, I remember I was so kind of steeped in it, and I have the X3 bar, and I remember doing the program at one point, and their owner John Jaquish was saying that he ate one meal every other day. And I remember thinking, okay, well, I'm going to bulk up in the uh, winter time. So I started eating like keto junk food and, mm-hmm. you know, still eating tons of meat, you know, fattiest meat I could get with bacon and everything. And then eating keto ice cream when I get home. And then my cutting plan was I was going to do one meal a day for a brief period of time. And I was going to go down to one meal every other day, which I did that for like probably a month or so. And I remember just like, thinking yeah this is it but like man did that suck because like now i eat I'm, I'm a flexible dieting guy right i mean i make pretty much whatever i want i try to get in as much fiber as i can reasonably mm-hmm. and like just looking back at it i'm like i didn't have to do any of that and like imagine all the muscle gains and everything i left on the table because i was such a fucking retard that bought into all just the carnivore dogma and i feel like a lot of people are at that point too and like i I just want to come on break out of it (laughs) yeah 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 it's actually it's funny that you bring up like the muscle gain thing because i still haven't heard anybody from the keto community explain to me how keto is supposed to be superior for muscle gains as opposed to like a carb inclusive diet Mm -hmm. because if you look at the physiology of it it's like there is no way that is clear like (laughs) if anything being on keto is like it it, it's not going to make it impossible to make gains by any means but compared to including carbs in your diet it's going to be an uphill battle like i don't think there's any physiological way against that glucose isn't free you got to get it from somewhere and it has to come from skeletal muscle because um there are even studies that show that or at least one really good study that shows that um dietary protein doesn't contribute a whole heck of a lot to gluconeogenesis it's almost like the amino acids have to go through a tissue intermediary before they can be um incorporated into that pathway quick i I hate to interrupt Mm -hmm. but um yeah for sure what they would typically say and i'm curious your answer to this is that um Glico- gluconeogenesis is demand driven so um when you're on like a keto or carnivore diet then um you'll make all the glucose that you need because it's demand driven that's what they would say now once again i don't know to the extent that that's true or not true um I, there, there was a, a lane norton and i can't remember the fucking dude's name but it, they went back and forth and the one dude said that in a study and i know i'm giving you like straws to grasp here yeah but he said good. that uh at the end or um i think they were comparing low carb people versus you know just like a moderate diet um i I think the guy said that the glycogen stores were similar by the end of the study but i could be Mm. incorrect yeah i know i know what you're talking about so liver liver glycogen when you're on keto like does deplete down to some minimal level uh muscle glycogen doesn't so muscle muscle glycogen on keto or not keto is probably going to be pretty well preserved um liver glycogen goes down on keto but the thing is that like i could grant all of that to somebody who wants to claim that keto is like better for muscle gains or whatever i could grant all of that stuff they still have to explain where the glucose is coming from like they still have to explain like how your body is getting that glucose and the answer to that question is it's getting it from skeletal muscle like it seems to be very much the case that the glucose has to be uh synthesized from amino acids that are um basically uh i don't know put through some tissue intermediary because dietary protein doesn't contribute that much to gluconeogenesis at all so it's almost like your body has to take those amino acid has to take those amino acids from skeletal muscle uh with you know um things like cortisol and whatnot so i mean yeah they'd have to explain like where the glucose is coming from if it's not from if it's not from amino acids and if it's from amino acids i mean that's that all of those amino acids that you're turning the glucose is all technically gains that you're not getting right glucose isn't free um there's a i phrased this in a i phrased this in a very succinct way that's escaping me right now but i'm gonna try to go to my old blog uh my blog spot blog just really quick without interrupting the conversation too much no, that's um 
And I'm going to try to find that article that I wrote. I believe it was in 2019, October. Yes, sugar doesn't cause diabetes and ketosis doesn't reverse it. Uh, or no, wait, that's not the one I'm looking for. I think it was the very first article that I published on this blog, actually. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Come on, man. Are you serious? Uh, oh, yeah. It's pretty funny, though. Uh, nutritional ketosis and muscle hypertrophy. Uh, the key points where muscle hypertrophy um, occurs when anabolic, uh, when anabolism outweighs catabolism, we have an obligate need to catabolize lean tissue while in ketosis. Uh, ketogenic diets unavoidably cost us anabolic potential. That's what that's what I was looking for. So yeah, there is anabolic potential that is lost with keto, but in virtue of the fact that you have to make the amino acid glucose conversion. What's up, everybody? Um, we're going to take a quick break and tell you about the show's sponsors. Um, we are brought to you by Element T Electrolytes. I've been using this stuff for years, and what I've honestly found is that if I didn't have electrolytes before some kind of cardio, and sometimes even before workouts, that my workout performance or definitely cardio performance would suffer greatly. Um, Sodium is responsible for every single movement pretty much in your entire body. And let's say you drink a lot of caffeine, <laughs> like I like to do, then um, maybe it is a good idea, like I do every single morning, um, put some LMNT chocolate electrolytes um, there in your coffee to get a little bit more sodium, potassium, and uh, magnesium in your coffee so that way whatever diuretic effect you get from the caffeine is pretty much diluted by the fact that you put chocolate salt in it. Um, also, it tastes really, really good. Get some uh, chocolate creamer, hazelnut creamer, or even coconut. And uh, mix that all up. It tastes really, really good. So uh, yeah, make sure you drop by, go to drinklmnt.com slash inliberty and health and uh, pick you up some electrolytes today. All right, guys. Thanks. Um, if you're just eating a potato instead, you don't have to do that conversion. You get the glucose by eating a fucking potato. <laughs> so yeah. I, I mean, there's... um. A there were studies done too. Now, um, I don't know any of them off the top of my head, but I know Lane's covered them on his channel. I know you've done some work with him. I believe you uh, contributed to his uh, paper on Paul Saladino's appearance on Joe Rogan as well. Oh, yeah. I can't remember the capacity in which I was involved with that, but I completely forgot about that until now. I'd have to go back and check. I I can't remember exactly what I helped him with there. Um, I would have to go back through my messages. I do remember that though. Mm -hmm. Um, that was so long ago. That was like two years ago at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it might've been longer than that because yeah, that was, it might've been. I think that was, I think that was like pre COVID. So I think that was probably like 2019, 2018. Yeah. Yeah. That was a long time ago, man. You got a good memory. I didn't even remember that shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that was, uh, I think one of the things that, I uh, kind of got me watching some of your stuff was, uh, seeing, um, I don't remember if it was you or whoever um, someone pointed out that you helped him or it might've been you that said that you helped him um, do some of the research for that specific debunk. But that kind of goes back to that uh, Brandolini's law you said earlier yeah, yeah, where yeah. Um, he said he spent like, you know, 40, 50 hours debunking a three hour podcast with over 200 sources. And once again, and he even said that like only one to 3% of the people click through the studies. So it's like, well what if he fucked something up and not that i think he did because lane's pretty good about that stuff um you know nobody's gonna know anyways oh wait i think i found it okay so paul i think was making some kind of a claim like um you know a single study showing a contradictory result topples an entire hypothesis which it's is a ludicrous thing. idea <laughs> yeah it, it, it's a ludicrous idea yeah. this idea is actually accounted for in science um it has a name uh well I, the, the specific phenomenon that he's talking about like i don't think it has a name but we, we actually expect contradictory results in science in virtue of something called the doom quine problem we always are in a state of not having perfect access to all of the background information that's mm -hmm going on all of the confounding variables all of the covariates that are running around in the background and every once in a while um even if like 99.9 percent .9 of our experiments yield the results that we expect we expect that at least one of those experiments will yield a result that 
we don't expect. And that's just due to like random stuff in the background that we're not aware of. Um, so that's like basically the short and skinny of the doom quine problem. Now, what Paul is saying is that if you have one contradictory finding that calls the entire hypothesis into question, and we, we just finished discussing why that's crazy. This is expected on science. <laughs> There's no reason why we shouldn't expect this. But like, let's take it to its logical extreme. And I I gave Lane um, a forest plot that has like, I don't know, it was like 300 studies or something like that. It was a meta-analysis of smoking and lung cancer in prospective cohort studies. And as you would imagine, for every like 100 studies or whatever that actually find a detriment, there's like one study that actually finds that there's a positive benefit from smoking. Right. So I took that one little study that showed a positive benefit. I was like, hey, Paul, how do you feel about that? Right. Because one contradictory finding topples an entire hypothesis. If your hypothesis is that smoking causes lung cancer, this one contradictory finding is quite a problem for you if that's your epistemic standard. Right. Mm -hmm. So in virtue of that, I mean, his his epistemology would appear to have a little bit of a fucking problem because signing off on it being unknown if smoking causes lung cancer is fucking crazy right <laughs> so i pointed this out to to uh to lane norton he was like that's a banger dude and he added it to a blog article <laughs> yeah yeah no dude that's uh that's awesome because uh that was like a uh i don't think i ever made it through that whole article but um it's huge the, yeah the, there's a lot of information in there um oh fuck i, I completely lost my train of thought i i had something else i wanted to go to but um okay so you know what maybe something good to go back to would be kind of like a seed oil so where mm -hmm. did kind of like a lot of the seed oil panic start from was it tucker goodrich or was it more of like this the number one story and the number one talk that i've always heard was like nina teichel saying that oh this is machine lubricant and mm -hmm. they wanted to advertise this as not your grandmother's butter or lard anymore <laughs> so yeah, yeah. you know they didn't have anywhere to put all this you know machine oil so they just started packaging up and sending it out and we never consumed this before and this correlates with all this disease and blah 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 blah, blah. now we're here and this is the blame for all our illnesses um i, I guess is that kind of like where it started or what's the history with all this, you know, hysteria around it? I don't know what the prime, I, like, I don't know who the prime mover is in terms of the anti-seed oil hysteria, <laughs> but um, there are some like notable figures that come up in conversation from, you know, time to time. Nina Teichels is definitely one of them because she wrote that like piece of revisionist history that everybody loves. Um, and then there's, you know, Tucker Goodrich, who's more or less just a Twitter clown. Um, I'm not entirely sure how much, like, yeah, he's just an NPC on Twitter, like, to be perfectly honest. So I, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure just how much he contributes to the wider consciousness on this topic. I would sooner go to people like maybe Paul Saladino, because he's got such a huge platform and he's always railing against these oils for some reason. Um who else probably ray peace was also pretty influential um to the point where he kind of became like a household name in the quack nutrition sphere so yeah i mean there were a few people who started out but the problem that they all have in common is that they don't have any good arguments <laughs> all of their arguments suck um i mean i have i have like a Oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, it's okay. Uh, I don't need to share my screen. <laughs> but I, if I can send that over to you. Well, like, so the one thing, oh man, you would think I would know how to how to change that. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing here. That's okay. All good. <laughs> but uh, like, okay, so the one thing that a lot of the keto guys will point out, and my brother even pointed this out to me, and not that I necessarily believed it because it just seemed kind of silly, but like the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is something that a lot of people mm -hmm. throw their hands up about. Like, oh, this is why we have to eat gra you know, grass-fed meat, which is kind of silly because you don't get a lot of omega-3 from there anyways. And yeah. um, it's just like some of the arguments around that just seemed a little silly. So I see you sent me that, but I go ahead on that. And then after that, we can dive into this or unless you think we should dive into this first. Oh, I can, I can address the ratio thing. Yeah. Sure. The ratio thing has never really been something that's panned out in any of the outcome literature at all. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it was something that was speculated about in a handful of papers um, by a few authors many, many, many years ago. And it's never really something that had a lot of validation behind it. The idea was that what are called these parent, parent fatty acids, um, which are linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid. One is the precursor for omega-3, one's the precursor for, you know, um, uh, omega-6. They're, they're omega-6 and omega-3, but they're precursors for to arachidonic acid, eicosapentaenoic acid, and dicosahexaenoic acid. So the idea was that these parent fatty acids competed for the same desaturase enzymes. So if they were out of balance, you wouldn't get the right amounts of these different fatty acids. It was just a conceptual kind of a priori thing it never really panned out in any of the outcome data and still doesn't. Um, I didn't address it in the big blog article because it's just such a, I, I mean, I guess I could go back and address it, but in almost every single case where we see an effect of the ratio, if there's also included a univariable analysis looking at omega-6 in isolation or looking at omega-3 in isolation, we almost never see an independent effect some deleterious effect of omega-6, and we almost always see some benefit of higher omega-3, and then when you put them into a ratio, it looks like, oh my god, the high, having a high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is so bad. It's like, no, look at the univariable analyses. It's just that having more omega-3 is good, not that having more omega-6 is bad, right? So, um, so when you put them into a ratio, it just it makes the effect look somewhat different, so a lot of people's imaginations get ahead of them. Uh, yeah, the ratio is not really like a validated concept. It doesn't really have a lot of data backing it. It's just like kind of an a priori thing that some researchers dreamed up that other researchers just kind of ran with. That's it, that's about my understanding based on what I've read. Mm -hmm. um, now, to address the image that I just sent you, it's going to you can't read anything on it. It's too small, but. This is a phylogenetic tree of anti-seed oil red herrings, and there's about 300-something of them. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, sorry, I was trying to um, zoom in on it to see. Yeah, yeah, see you won't be able to zoom in on it. It's too, it's too small. <laughs> but every single branch on that tree, um, since share, screen, right? since, yeah, since screen sharing. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you started sharing. There we go. Am, am I at the right thing now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like okay. every single, you won't be able to zoom in. Uh, yeah, I yeah. probably need to share my screen. But yeah, like every single point or, or branch there is like an anti-seed oil red herring. Some of these are pretty funny. Like um, mm -hmm. there's like King Henry VIII, though, which is something that I've heard before. Mm -hmm. There's um, uh, globalization, though, stabbings, though, spontaneous combustion, though. That's Nina Teicholz's one, spontaneous combustion. Um, Indian Railway Study, though. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's just, there's so many of these. Rancid, though, polymerization, though, genetic modification, though, solvents, though, <laughs> acrylamide, though. It's just, I've heard it all in so many debates with these people that I started actually just collecting what these people were telling me. And I put them all into a phylogenetic tree and they're all kind of like categorized by different species of red herring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you should be able to share now. I think I, I, I finally got it going. Oh. I don't know if you your picture might come up a little bit better than mine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Okay. Here's, here's where the fun starts. <laughs> so we have the entire phylogenetic tree Okay, yeah, and no, then, that definitely does look better. Holy yeah, and, hell. <laughs> and then we can zoom in on a particular branch. So yeah. there's two two main branches um mm -hmm. at the beginning. There's mechanisms though or stories though. <laughs> so let's let's go down mechanism lane here. Okay, Not mechanisms. Ancestral. Though. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Unnatural though. Not ancestral though. Um, face shape though <laughs> industrial <laughs> though cheap though plastic bottles though mm -hmm. um unnatural though spooky production 98 years of corn though <laughs> I, I like the uh the chicken and pork fat because that was a uh, pretty big claim it's saying yeah, uh, yeah, paul yeah. saladino i remember he had a whole podcast said chicken is killing you yeah and uh i never <laughs> like I, we were kind of talking about it a little bit earlier but it, it was so funny to me to realize like man you were like 
basically just dispensing eating disorders to people by telling yeah. them shit like that. It's so <laughs> fucked up. It's like buying an eating disorder out of a vending machine with Paul <laughs> Saladino's face on it. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> How it's made, so, though, yeah, that's uh, the Nina Teichel's car emissions. Press oh, case, yeah. chemical extraction, autism. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah autism though <laughs> i can't believe that there's really th that all of those have been thrown out there globalization i could believe that because um and i i have a lot of friends who do research into like some of the globalist stuff but like my problem with some of it is that sometimes people just like go so broad on their theories that like no matter what happens you could drop a pin and you'll be right because you don't specify anything yeah i i'm kind of like in terms of political economy i'm kind of quietest about it because i find that a lot of the people who make like really bold claims about how the world should be run like the noam chomsky's of the world oh and we need to be like under anarcho syndicalism because it allows for x or we need to be under capitalism because it allows for x and we need to be under communism because it allows for x and it's like these are all empirical questions and none of you are bringing any fucking data to the table you're all just bringing like your own personal normative opinions to the table it, it, these are empirical claims these aren't normative claims we, we we need to actually like have data to show that one of these systems of political economy actually works um according to these goals better than the others and until we have that, I'm going to be kind of quietest about the whole thing. Like, I, I don't know. I don't have that data. Um, so I, I I don't know which system of political economy is best for yeah, humans. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 right. I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to push you into a political thing. but uh, Oh, no. No, it, it's, it's all good. Yeah, it just kind of came to mind. Penis rashes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the the one there was that video of Paul Saladino in the store saying the children's taints are shrinking, <laughs> and, but you you didn't hear that. No, you was... didn't hear that. <laughs> yeah, he's literally in the grocery store saying like you know his usual thing is like being shirtless in the grocery <laughs> store, and they're saying something about like the children's taints shrinking, and, and it's like who the fuck is measuring this? Like who who grabs like a five year old kid? Holds him by a leg with a uh, ruler and puts a fucking uh, ruler between yeah. their fucking sack and ass and says, oh, <laughs> "Yeah, that's a that's a that's a quarter inch shorter from last year." <laughs> like, Spread what? your cheeks and lift your sack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Dave Chappelle joke. I don't know if he got it. No, I'm sorry. Oh damn. Maybe so, yeah. Somebody. It's so one of the viewers. Will. <laughs> okay. Eight hundred dollar. Uh, Jeez, I cannot believe that literally all of these are corn oils, not a seed. Oh yeah, that's a, a Tucker Goodrich CBD yeah. reporting, ecological data, hunter gatherers. Yeah, that, that's like the default thing. They always leave out the gatherer part. Um, I had Alan mm -hmm. Flanagan on a couple. Uh, I would say probably like eight months ago or so, and uh, him and I kind of talked about the ancestral diet, and it's like ancestral to who? Yeah, that's another question. Is yeah it's not clear exactly like because ancestral ancestral is like relative to a population right? right and not every population has the same ancestry so it's like ancestral relative to what population mm -hmm. and yeah that's a really good question they should be able to produce an answer to that although i have a pretty good argument against ancestral diets in general yeah, um, yeah go ahead go ahead i'm i'm curious yeah it's um so it's based on a phenomenon in um, evolutionary biology known as antagonistic pleiotropy. Um, antagonistic pleiotropy is when a gene um, positively affects uh, reproduction, like it has a fecundity advantage in the short term, but in the long term it has like a detriment to the organism's overall health status or um, you know longevity or whatnot. And there are examples of this in the human body, for example, like uh, LDL, you know, you need those lipoproteins to shuttle fats around. There's no question about it. Um, LDL have, like, a lot of benefits early in life. They keep you from getting, like, fatty liver and stuff, and they're all cool. Uh, and they give you heart disease later in life, right? So that that's an example of antagonistic pleiotropy in the human body. Um, you know, male androgens, like, um, androgenic hormones, like uh, testosterone, really good for fecundity they give you a really good fecundity advantage um because well when your testosterone's high you want to fuck like crazy which is great for making babies and stuff but then you know testosterone also gives you like prostate cancer when you're like in your 60s so yeah i mean 
there are all sorts of examples of antagonistic pleiotropy in the human body. And so if we just say, listen, if antagonistic pleiotropy happens more often than not, and we're eating these foods that ostensibly are ancestral, meaning that we have more adaptations to them compared to a novel food, that means that when we're engaging with these foods and eating them, we're actually running the risk of activating at least one gene that has an antagonistically pleiotropic action, right? And since novel foods that we create ourselves don't belong to the domain of foods that can be antagonistically pleiotropic because we didn't evolve eating them, then that means that their effects on short-term health and long-term health are basically just 50-50. It's a black box, right? But the effect of an ancestral food is not 50-50. It's the, the chances of it being a detriment is actually greater than 50 uh, because of antagonistic pleiotropy. But with a novel food, it's 50-50. So as long as you have data, as long as you have data showing that there are no disadvantages to a novel food over an ancestral food in the reproductive window, so in the first 40 years of life, you can actually just extrapolate from there and say the novel food is actually a a safer bet than the ancestral food in the post-reproductive window because it's less likely to activate those antagonistically pleiotropic pathways. Um, and that's like kind of an, it, it's kind of like a, it's not a super strong position. It's like it's not a super strong argument, but it's a decent a priori argument uh, just against um, the idea that ancestral is always better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, that that argument's on my blog in like and it's been formalized on my blog so it's actually informal like logic <laughs> if anybody actually wants to like take a crack at it and tell me what's wrong with it they're free to do this and they're free to do so i've had plenty of debates about it and so far nobody's been able to actually render a position against it that's even remotely interesting um yeah i i would say it's it, it's an okay it's an okay argument i mean so far it seems to be doing pretty well there's a cut down version of the argument which is just if the health value of any natural food can be improved upon by artificial manipulation, then there are unnatural diets that are superior to ancestral diets, just straightforwardly, right? And that's a much simpler argument to make, and we have examples of that all over the place. Like golden rice, for example, better. it's artificial, it's a GMO, um, it's that genetically engineered rice that's high in beta carotene, so it like corrects vitamin A deficiency and whatnot. Mm -hmm easily superior to the natural rice that you can get right? right so yeah if you take a perfectly natural diet quote unquote that just has the normal rice and then swap it out for the golden rice you have an unnatural diet that's basically superior to an to a natural diet so that's a little bit more of a straightforward argument against ancestral diets um yeah uh, ancestral diets I, I still don't quite understand like why people have this intuition that natural is always better. <laughs> I, I personally don't get it, but yeah, I mean, you see people throw that out a lot because I think they think that like you're closer to nature. So nature must inherently be good, but it's kind of funny. And he might be somebody that you may not completely agree with, but a uh, Ted name and he was kind mm. of a guy that put this into my brain of uh processed food, not always being bad. Where like, if you yeah. think about, kind of going back to like the spectrum that I was referring to earlier, perhaps to your uh, satire or uh, your Nutridex, um, you could think of a protein powder as like a really, really good food because you're taking out all the carbohydrates, fats, sugars, or whatever, and then yeah. isolating it down just to a strict protein. Same deal with maybe like a fat-free Greek yogurt. Um, those are just the first two that come to mind. Or maybe even like a beef jerky where you're taking out a lot of the fats and you're just kind of rendering it down to a, a protein. Um I see that as a form of processing that's actually good because you're getting rid of a lot of the nutrients or not the nutrients, but like a lot of the calories that you don't necessarily need and getting just like the most important part of it, which generally is going to be the protein for those foods. And that's not to say that you shouldn't have like fats or carbohydrates, but yeah. in some situations it's probably better that you have that rather than, you know, like a chocolate chip cookie whey protein powder is going to be good than just eating a giant chocolate chip cookie. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that's kind of the way that I've come to look at processed foods. It's like, well, what's a process, the processing doing, are you adding a bunch of oils and added sugars to make it taste really good? Or are you taking out all the carbohydrates and fats and making it a more, you know, leaner source of like protein? Yeah. So 
yeah, I mean, food processing, whether or not it's going to be good or bad, just relates to whether or not it is going to comport with some goal that you have. I mean, if your goal is to cut carbs and fat, because maybe you want to lean out while sparing muscle, and you want to eat like a lot of protein at the expense of carbs and fat. Yeah, protein powder is a good way to do it. I mean, can't think of very many foods actually that would be as good as a protein powder for facilitating that goal. So in that context, the processed food is actually good because it's good with respect to a goal, which is like the only way that I could think to intelligibly cash out the word good anyway, right? It's with respect to this goal, it's good. With, re with respect to another goal where somebody is trying to bulk, maybe it's not so good because right. you benefit from adding carbs and fat in that case. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's kind of my attitude about processed foods as well. I mean, they're just good or bad with, res with respect to a goal. Like for example, I, I had this... What I, what I didn't think was a super hot take on Twitter, maybe about a year, year and a half ago or whatever, but I got pilloried for it by a lot of the whole food purists out there. I said, um, it's largely the case that processed foods have more life-saving potential in the hospital than whole foods. And people mm. lost their fucking minds. Because, because you attacked their religion. <laughs> but yeah, well, I had to explain to all these people that like, hey, listen, do you think that somebody with wasting is going to have an easier time sucking down Pepsi and cookies or steak and bone broth, right? Uh, you know, Pepsi and cookies is probably going down easier and will probably save their life, <laughs> you know? Um the next step from that is probably if you can't use like the least satiating foods on the planet to rescue this person from their wasting, well, the next step there is like intravenous nutrition, right? But you certainly wouldn't reach for a steak. You certainly wouldn't reach for a salad. You wouldn't reach for beans. You wouldn't reach for fruit and vegetables. You'd reach for cookies and potato chips if you wanted to save that person's life, right? Uh, like, for example, there was one time I had to rescue a type one diabetic who um, went hypoglycemic during a work day. I was I was working at a restaurant in the city and I one of my coworkers was type one diabetic and he he dosed his insulin wrong before he went to work and he went hypoglycemic while we were at work. And I wasn't rushing to him to and like feeding him like apples and grapes and shit. I cracked open a fucking bottle of pineapple juice and i just basically poured it down his throat <laughs> you know so with respect to the goal is 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 the name of the game like the process the, the food processing food processing whether or not it's good or bad just cashes out into whether or not it's compatible with a goal um you know grapes are not compatible with rescuing a type 1 diabetic who's in distress um steak is not compatible generally not compatible with rescuing somebody who's wasting and, you know, uh, protein powders are generally compatible with uh, or more compatible with cutting than less lean sources of protein. Like, it just all depends on your goals. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And it's, it's frustrating to see people who just have zero nuance about this. And um, I can't believe that you got pilloried for that. I, I mean, I can't believe it. But at the same <laughs> I, time, I, I feel like posting it again, just to see if it happens. Again. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I had that conversation with my wife um, a couple, a couple times recently, because like, um, someone close to me is having an issue keeping food down. And, um, you know, obviously I talked to her a decent bit and, and I told her like, well, maybe it's good to get like some full fat yogurt, some peanut butter, coconut butter, so almond butter, something that's going to be very, very hard to like put down something that just tastes really freaking good because like it, like yeah. you said, if you're wasting away, it's probably better that you get just junk food in than nothing. Cause I'd rather yeah. see somebody live and eat junk food than die and eat clean like at the end of the day what what, what the fuck's the difference if you're gonna I die mean, you know because <laughs> think about it um in a clinical setting when somebody's wasting what is their health turning on calories right. when we recommend people go on whole food diets what exactly are we targeting there in order to keep them from like becoming overweight we're, we're basically making the admission that a whole foods diet is hard, is harder to, or uh, is more resistant to overconsumption, right. right? It's more resistant to overconsumption. Why would you give somebody who's wasting whole foods in that case? You would give them fucking potato chips and Pepsi. Like easily they win in that scenario, right? Um, yeah, it's wild. I, I feel like 
posting that on Twitter again just to see like how people respond to it now because it's been like a year and a half since I've had that like hot take on Twitter. It, it's it, I think it's time for it to see the light again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um I'll definitely retweet it because I think that's uh that's that's worthy. Um and th that's another thing that like when it comes to diet, I really try to just like cool down the zealousness and like just how fucking mm -hmm. hard people go at each other. It's like this doesn't have to be like all or nothing and you guys just get so fucking dogmatic. There's all these diet wars. Like, why can't we just say, like, we'll, we'll tailor nutrition personally to people and mm -hmm. whatever works for that person is good. But, like, to just say, oh, all gluten is bad, all this is bad, all that is bad, seems a little ridiculous. Um, So, you know what? Actually, one thing that I wanted to ask you about, because this is something that – I, I, I've changed my mind on because once again, as a former carnivore, I used to be of the mind that, oh, saturated fat, whatever, you know, as long as you're lean and healthy, it's good. Um, I still eat red meat, I would say pretty frequently, but definitely over time, I've opted for more and more lean cuts. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to like ground beef, uh, I eat it pretty much almost every single day. This week I haven't because I just didn't the any, but I always go for like the leanest I can get. Um, when it comes to ordering steaks, now when I go out, I always go for top sirloin rather than a ribeye. Um, if, in your opinion, and by the bulk of the literature, do you think that somebody who is in good body composition and gets, let's say, anywhere from 30 to 70 grams of fiber a day and exercises reasonably, if they still have saturated fat, let's say sometimes it may go up to the range of 15%, and I don't know, honestly, where I fall on this, but do you still think that they would be at like a reasonable risk of developing heart disease? Or would you say that they're just kind of like at a slightly higher risk than somebody who has all the same behaviors, but a lower saturated fat intake? I know it's a loaded so, question. Yeah. Uh I am stoked to tell you guys about the show's new sponsor. I am now working with MTS Nutrition, which is a brand that I've believed in for a very long time, and they run awesome cells and they have awesome products. So um, I want to tell you about their amazing protein powder, which you're going to ask me how many pounds I have of the protein powder, and the answer is all of them. So here I got red velvet cake, 25 grams of protein, and they have the amino acids and everything on there, 59 servings. Peanut butter fluff, uh, fluffernutter, 26 grams of protein, and then also the chocolate chip cookie, which literally has real pieces of chocolate chip cookie in there. So 27 grams of protein, 180 calories. As I've talked about on the show, getting your protein in is very, very important, so make sure you hit that link below and purchase your protein powder through MTS Nutrition. Boom! It, it's, yeah, there's definitely a lot there. I wouldn't say it's loaded, but there's a lot there. Um, so I would say that... So when we're looking at saturated fats, its relationship with heart disease, um, there's a there there's a mediator variable between saturated fat and heart disease. It's LDL, right? So saturated fats influence on heart disease is going to be mediated by LDL. If you're eating saturated fat and you just so happen to be a genetic anomaly and your LDL doesn't respond to it, probably not going to get heart disease as a function of your saturated fat intake. Mm -hmm. hmm. But if you are somebody who responds like wildly to saturated fat in your blood lipids, like I know there are some people in the keto community where they add saturated fat to their diet and then boom, all of a sudden their, their LDL is like up in the 400s. It's like, holy crap. Um, yeah, I would definitely say that those people are at an increased risk. Now, if you're, if you're eating saturated fat and your blood lipids go up minorly, but you're also engaging in all of these other healthy behaviors, it's possible that your entire risk profile is like all around good but it might be better like if you like swap the saturated fat with something else for example um it really all just depends on the individual but i can tell you that in a general sense you're probably better off lowering saturated fat all things equal but i i just want to caveat that with you know, like it just depends on who you are sure. the you, you know tj on twitter eh um he's uh he's the guy who does the body weight exercises and stuff oh yeah um, uh jt tech uh, no tech sarah um i know who you're talking about though yeah. yeah yeah i don't know how to pronounce his last name so i just called him jt <laughs> but uh yeah he, he doesn't respond at all to saturated fat like he's done like he's done stuff like with and without saturated fat his his ldl doesn't do anything right so i don't think he's at an increased risk as a function of his saturated fat intake 
Um, but yeah, if your blood lipids go up wildly, it's like probably best to cool it, <laughs> you know? Okay. Yeah. That, that's kind of what I seem to interpret from, um, the saturated fat stuff. And once again, you guys, you know, Simon, um, Alan, Danny all know way, 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 way more about this stuff than I do, because it seemed like the common knowledge, like 15, 20 years ago was that as long as your HDL to triglycerides is good, then mm. um, LDL doesn't really matter. But then it seems like it, people have kind of come back around to saying like, no, LDL is in fact causative. Um, it was interesting for me because when I was carnivore, my LDL was 160. Uh, and this was a few years ago. I haven't had a blood lipid panel in quite a while. I would actually like to get another one because now I'm normally in that range of like 30 to 70 grams of fiber a day. But like I said, when I was on carnivore, eating all the fattier cuts of meat, butter in the coffee, you name it. Yeah, my, yeah, my yeah. LDL was 160, which to me, you know, obviously that's on the high end of normal. Yeah, would be better. Well, yeah, I, I would. I would say it's yeah, it's definitely on the higher end. Yeah, but like in my mind, it. I, I like like you said. Normally, when people go keto or carnivore, their LDL skyrockets. So for me, yeah, it seemed like I felt like mine should have been higher. But um, do you think like one sixty? Like I said, I haven't had it in years. But um, one sixty would be like, hey, that should probably be lowered. Like, yeah, where would you put that risk wise? Uh, like 160 if it's like really recalcitrant and doesn't want to like come down um in response to intervention i would just say like probably consider a statin mm -hmm. um but yeah i would say 160 is pretty damn high like okay. i i have an ldl of 90 and i'm like kind of nervous <laughs> mm -hmm. um because in the literature uh plaque progression is possible um or likely on average um anywhere north of 70 milligrams per deciliter um mm -hmm. south of 70 milligrams per deciliter it actually seems like if you are dropping it to within that range from baseline you get plaque regression mm -hmm. so yeah the turning point for plaque progression versus regression is somewhere around 70 milligrams per deciliter which is not easy to get to without drugs um 160 i yeah i Personally, I wouldn't be comfortable with an LDL that high. There's a vegan on my server who has like genetically high LDL and he he eats like a really good diet, but he still has LDL in like the 140s and he's pretty nervous about it too. Um so yeah, I mean, I I I personally wouldn't tolerate it that high, but uh, I mean, my best advice would be to talk to your doctor about it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, I obviously, you know, for everybody listening, this is medical advice, but just kind of like curious about your read on on the lipid stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Now, so like the first steps, it seems to be like you probably want to obviously have like lots of fiber because fiber is going to help offset some like the uh, deleterious effects from saturated fat. And um, from what I understand, there was also studies done where people who have like a high fruit and vegetable intake with a high meat intake actually seem to live the longest. I know that was, um, mm. I wish I had like the names of these studies on the top of my head. I, just I think that, I, I, yeah, I think Lane Norton's shared one kind of like that in, in the, in the mm. past. Um, yeah. Let, ref, yeah. With fiber, actually the, the mechanism there with fiber is a little interesting the way fiber lowers LDL is it disrupts what's called enterohepatic cholesterol circulation. Mm -hmm. So your liver dumps a bunch of cholesterol through the biliary system into your intestines like every single day. I think um, over the course of a day, it's like 10 grams worth of cholesterol that gets circulated every day mm -hmm. through your intestines. And then it goes back up to your liver and then it spills back out into your intestines and it does this loop. And even if there isn't 10 grams total of cholesterol 10 grams worth will make that trip and when you eat a lot of fiber the cholesterol will bind to the fiber and will get excreted rather than reabsorbed mm -hmm. so that's that's the mechanism by which fiber lowers one's cholesterol is it just disrupts that circulation um so yeah that's pretty effective like fiber is pretty effective to the best of my knowledge that can reduce your ldl by like 10 or more milligrams per deciliter so for some people like even more um i i believe like exercise also has um an effect on lowering ldl very very marginally avoiding sugar has a very very marginal effect avoiding saturated fat has a pretty big effect in the typical person 
Um, avoiding dietary cholesterol has a very, very minor effect, maybe 10 milligrams per deciliter, but it all adds up and you could very easily get like a 60, 70 milligrams, 800 milligram per deciliter decrease by just optimizing all of these things. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I would just talk to your doctor about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, another thing that kind of the um, the LDL denialists, if you will, kind of talk about is statins and their ability or well, their supposed ability to um, have an effect on like overall cognitive performance and um, mm. like the downsides of statins. Um is that just kind of like, hey, typically people in older populations get prescribed statins, so like there's probably a confounding variable there, or what do you make of that? I don't really know. Um, I haven't seen any literature personally that de persuasively demonstrates like um, detrimental cognitive effects of statins. Uh, I am aware of one study, though, I think it was called the Samson study, where they they investigated um, statin side effects, where they had like a bunch of groups. There was like a genuine placebo group that wasn't getting anything. And then there was like a fake placebo group where they, they, they got placebo, but they were told they were getting a statin. And then there was an actual statin group, but they were told they were getting placebo. Um, and then there was an actual statin group where they were told that they were getting statins or, or, or no, they weren't told that they were getting statins. Um, so the, the design was something like that. I have to refresh my memory, but it was something like that. But eventually at, after they collected all the data, all of the side effect data, the primary endpoints are all like side effects, right? Um, after they collected all that data, they actually found out that like 90% of the side effects, because you have all of these groups and you can really disambiguate where the side effects are occurring. They found out that about 90% of the side effects that people re report with statins are just like placebo effect <laughs> like or, or nocebo effect, mm -hmm. right? So people just have like really kind of jittery attitudes about taking new medications and it creates a lot of anxiety and they dream up all sorts of ways that their bodies are reacting that are actually just entirely in their heads. And that's very, very common. Like, I know I'm susceptible to the placebo effect. If I try some new intervention, like if I do something for myself, you're just like, oh, yeah, I wonder if this is going to do anything. I generally end up bullshitting myself into believing that something has happened. Yeah, it's like magic. My God, some the lights just turned on. It's like it happens like every single time. I know I'm very susceptible to this. Yeah. So it doesn't shock me at all that like statins... Um, like like people getting prescribed a statin and they're taking a statin and just like yeah they might imagine that all these negative things are happening in their bodies but the best available research on the subject would lead us to believe that that's probably just placebo effect more often than it isn't mm -hmm. so um statins like i said they, they seem to be widely like debated amongst those people but it like the more i listen to you guys you know alan and all the people that we've kind of been talking about um mm -hmm. it just seems like they've been demonstrably proven that they're effective and safe and that like you know if you do have a stubborn ldl then it's probably good that you get on one so i'll be 29 yeah. in november and i plan to get a blood lipid test obviously before then but um I I've kind of like debated this. I'm like, you know, if my LDL is still high, fuck might be uh not a terrible idea to get on a, like a low grade statin if I can't produce it naturally. And, and like people have this, you know, naturalist fallacy stuck in their head that we've mm -hmm. kind of talked about throughout the show too, um, where like, oh, if I'm taking a medication, this is bad. But like, it's, it's just a tool. It's just a tool. It's not good or yeah, bad. Yeah. It's just if it can help you, it can help you. There are lipid lowering medications that that have, to my knowledge, even better side effect profiles that um, can lower LDL by a decent amount. And like Zetia, for example, um, its mechanism of action is to block cholesterol uptake in the gut. So like it just clogs the little receptor that takes up uh, cholesterol. So it's kind of like the same mechanism as fiber almost, but like on crack. <laughs> it it actually like literally blocks the transporter that takes the cholesterol up. Um, that can lower LDL by like, I think maybe 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter, sometimes more. Um, I would have to refresh myself on that literature, but yeah, Zidia is pretty good. Um, I think the uh, actual name of the drug is azetamibe. And yeah, there are some statins out there with like really 
good um, side effect profiles. I think like Resuva Satin has got a pretty good side effect profile. Um, but I'm not an expert in statins or anything like that. I've just had to read a lot of that literature to like dunk on clowns and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well I, I guess that provides a good pivot um any uh debates going on in the future uh no they're all cucks <laughs> <laughs> no. so, so, so you're saying that we're not gonna see a tucker goodrich debate anytime soon N no i mean okay so i don't know if you're familiar with discord yeah. um but yeah, on my Discord server, there's a channel in there called the Cuck Truck, and it's just all it's just an inventory of people who have dodged debates with me, and they're all high high profile people. I've extended invitations and they all just cope and dodge and cuck and just do really like, really dishonest shit. But like probably the most dishonest out of all of them, or the one that disappoints me the most is probably Paul Saladino, because I have seven outstanding open invitations to him to debate and he keeps on saying like once every couple months he go, he'll go on social media and he'll be like nobody will debate me and i'm like dude i've invited you like seven times um and i think it's because he has this tendency where he only debates people that he thinks are white belts and he's a green belt and when like a purple brown or black belt shows up he just like tucks his tail and runs away right mm -hmm. really shameful behavior and i think he developed that behavior after alex leaf like just destroyed him in a debate like halfway through the debate you just see like paul's face just like like he's just he's just done because he knows he's been annihilated and he just starts rambling about something else it's really hilarious but yeah alex leaf destroyed him and i think ever since then paul has not been interested in debating but uh, no, I can't find anybody to debate. Once people understand that you're actually like competent at debate and you can hold your own in a debate and you're not going to be a slouch and you're going to hold people's feet to the fire, when people realize this, all of the sudden their courage just kind of drains out of them and they do not want to engage with you. Um, so the closer and closer you get to the top in the debate competence world, the lonelier it is, right? The better you are at debate, the less likely it is that you're going to find somebody to actually like debate with. Like back in the day, I used to be top eight masters as Zerg in StarCraft too, right? Back in the day, I used to play the oh, ladder and God. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, I used to play the ladder and shit. And there, were, there was a point where the closer you get to the top of the ladder, the longer you're waiting to queue up a game. Like, I was waiting to queue up for, like, five minutes sometimes. You know, if I was down in Platinum League, you queue up instantly. The second you press the button, you got a game. Um, at In Top 8, like, I was queuing up for, like, three minutes sometimes. And it's like, man, like, uh, it's kind of lonely at the top, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's just, like, nobody who's willing to throw down. Um, so I guess, yeah, as long as uh, there's an audience listening... If I've said anything that you find objectionable, you can find me on my Discord server and we can have it out, man. <laughs> um, I'm always willing to uh, to get into a debate uh, as long as I find it interesting and I think that there's value in it. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think that's a, uh, as good a place as any to uh, cap it off. Uh, Nick, where mm -hmm. can everybody find you? I've, I've, like I said throughout the show, I've enjoyed your stuff. And um, Thanks. you and everybody else has really changed my mind on a lot of the nutritional stuff and I'm really, really thankful for it. And I kind of look back at like my recommendations to everybody throughout the years. I'm like, man, I, I probably fuck some people up and that, that's, that's <laughs> um, my bad. Like I, yeah. I, I'm an asshole for it, but you know, the only, the only thing I could do now is just kind of look back and say, I fucked up. I was wrong, but yeah, know, yeah. let's kind of move forward. So yeah. Where can everybody find you? Yeah. You can find me at Twitter, um, mostly on Twitter or YouTube, um, uh, at it's just youtube.com slash C slash c slash the nutrivore or on twitter twitter.com slash the nutrivore no spaces um or on my discord server those are the primary platforms there is also a mastodon account but i don't remember it you can find it in the links on my youtube channel <laughs> but yeah those are the primary places you can find me honestly if you just go to the youtube channel click on any of my most recent videos there will be an inventory of lists or like there will be an inventory of all of the relevant social media links and whatnot uh included um so yeah you can find me on any of the included platforms 
Nice man. Well, I enjoyed this chat. We'll definitely have to do it again sometime. And uh, you'll have to uh, let me know the next time you dunk on some uh, seed oil zealots or carnivore <laughs> zealots. I'd love to see it. <laughs> yeah, I'll send it to you. Nice man. All right. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. And until next time, take care.